Hello my dear students hope you are fine Today will be the last class on muscle tissue Today we will discuss about the microanatomy or the ultra micro structures of the muscle Also the arrangement of the myofibrils that is present within the muscles Also some of the important topics which are very much correlated with your uh, physiological functions or physiology that is myoneuronal junction or neuromuscular junction how they are organized and how the muscle contraction takes place at the same time we will see a video to make the things more clear and uh, also we will discuss some of the important topics which are very much common nowadays uh, and also very much uh, used in the robotics that is the spart muscles and uh, shunt muscles so let's start the microanatomy of the muscle cells Voluntary muscles are composed of numerous cylindrical muscle fibers or muscle cells which are held together in a matrix of connective tissue. Now, muscle cells are composed of sarcolemma, sarcoplasm, nucleus, myofibrils or myofilaments, sarcomere, mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum and centrotubules or t-tubules now what is sarcolemma sarcolemma is nothing but the cell membrane of muscle cells it is composed of outer and inner protein layer and intermediate lipid layers it has electrical properties that means depolarization wave can conduct along the sarcolemma to spread all over the cell sarcoplasm it is the cytoplasmic portion of the muscle cell or you can say the cytoplasm of the muscle cell it is semi fluid non contractile and it contains all other cellular organelles nucleus skeletal muscle nucleus are oval in shape they are multiple in number and they are peripherally placed beneath the sarcolemma mitochondria skeletal muscle needs mitochondria for its contraction in case of skeletal muscle or any muscle cells the mitochondria is known as sarcosome it provides energy in the form of atp for the work of muscle fibers sarcoplasmic reticulum these are the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cells it is composed of centrotubules or t tubules and complex interconnecting membranous structures in this picture we can see all the things that we have already mentioned the covering or cell membrane of the muscle cell that is sarcolemma peripheral nucleus mitochondria which are over here the light blue in color and cylindrical filaments that is the myofibrils in between these myofibrils there are a complex network of centrotubules or t tubule on each side of the t tubules there are some filamentous structure that is called the terminal cisterna they are nothing but the sarcoplasmic reticulum that we have mentioned earlier and this is the triad that i will discuss after some time yes now let's talk about the centrotubules or t tubules it is the tubular growth or invasionation of the sarcolemma within the myofibrils it helps in the conduction of the action potential interior to the myofibrils diet one t tubule and one sarcoplasmic reticulum is forming the diet diet means two so one t tubule one sarcoplasmic reticulum usually diets are found in cardiac muscles as we are talking about the skeletal muscle most important thing is triad over here one t tubule and two sarcoplasmic reticulum on each side in the form of terminal cisterna that we have seen already found in skeletal muscle 
over here the picture is very close very clear we can see that yellow color thing is the t-tubules and on either side of the t-tubule we can see this bluish color area these are nothing but the terminal cisterna we can see and they are actually coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum combinedly this two terminal cisterna and the central t-tubule is called triad now very important thing that is the myofilaments myofilaments are present within the myofibrils or the muscle cells myofibrils are contractile unbranched parallel threads situated along the long axis of the entire muscle fibers myofibrils are composed of longitudinal oriented protein filaments that is called the myofilaments and these myofilaments are two types thick filament and thin filaments thick filament is myosin filament thin filaments are three actin troponin tropomyosin but myosin and actin these two filaments are maximum in numbers about 55 of the total protein filaments and in case of troponin there are three sites I site or inhibitory site C site for the calcium binding site and T site for binding with the tropomyosin because troponin is attached with the tropomyosin in this picture the total orientation of the filaments over here this purple color thick filaments that is the myosin filament and red color thin filament that is the actin filaments over here we can see the actin filaments this red color thin actin filaments with ultra magnification we can see how they are arranged these rounded structures are nothing but the actin filaments over these actin filaments there is a rope like or thread like green color tropomyosin and we can see that actin filaments are having some active sites that is yellow in color over here and those active sites are covered by this tropomyosin at the same time we can see that troponin molecules are attached over the tropomyosin so this is the arrangement of the thin filaments now this is the thick filament or myosin filament it has a long tail and a head and the head can bend on itself by the hinge movement head is always trying to bind with the active side of the actin filaments that we have seen and this binding is happened by the use of an ATP now what is the arrangement of the myofibrils each myofibrils are present in its lengthwise an alternate dark band that is called the A band and a light band that is called the I band each I band present a dark transverse line in its middle known as Z line or Z disc also known as Krauss membrane each A band presents a middle clear area known as H band or Hansen's band each H band present a dark line in its middle called M line it contains creatinine kinase enzyme now this is the arrangement we can see that this blue color thing is Z line and this green color things are the actin filaments the red color areas are the thick myosin filaments and we can see that from Z line to Z line this is totally exarcomer and this is a contractile unit and importantly there is a A band which is extending from the myosin end to end and within this A band there is a Z zone or Z band H band sorry H band which is con containing 
the myosin filaments and within the A zone there is a central line that is called the M line. On the other hand we can see over here only myosin actin filaments are present over here which is called the I band. So I band is a light band and the A band containing all the interdigitation of the actin and myosin filaments so it is the dark band. But there is interestingly Z line con is present only actin filaments within the actin filaments. I band both uh, A band is having both actin and the myosin filament we can see in A band there is interdigiting actin filaments within the myosin filaments and M line is only present within the myosin filaments or we can say the Z zone is only having the myosin filaments only. So this is the arrangement. Same pictures over here. Over here this is the myosin filaments purple color and red color actin filaments that is interdigitating. This area is the I band and this is totally A band we can see A band and within A band the only myosin filaments are A zone and within the A zone the central stem that is called the M line and within the actin filament this zigzag line is nothing but the Z line. So from Z line to Z line one single contractile unit that is called the sarcomere what we have mentioned over here. It is the contractile unit of the tissue extending from the Z line to another Z line. It includes a whole A band and a portion of the I band on each side of the A band. Length 2 to 3 micrometer in relaxation and 1 micrometer in contraction. That means Z line shrink when there is muscle contraction. The picture. Now motor innervation of the skeletal muscle because we are going to discuss about the neuromuscular junction so we need to know something about the neuron that is supplying the muscles. So motor neurons are the cell that cause muscle fiber to contract obviously. These are two types alpha fiber uh, supply the extrafusal fiber of the muscle for movements and the gamma fibers supply the muscle spindle for the maintenance of the muscle tone. So there are two types of fiber one is alpha fiber and one is gamma fiber. These are the nerve fibers obviously. This alpha nerve fiber is supplying the extrafusal fiber and those extrafusal fibers of the muscles are actually doing the muscle movements. On the other hand the gamma, gamma neuronal fibers are supplying the muscle spindles. Muscle spindles are the special structure that is helping for the maintenance of the muscle tone. So what is motor unit? It's an important short note. Skeletal muscles are made up of thousands of muscle fibers obviously. A single motor neuron may directly control a few fibers within a muscle or hundreds of thousands of muscle fibers. All of the, all of the muscle fibers that is controlled by a single motor neuron constitute a motor unit. That means a single motor nerve can control billions or thousands or numerous muscle fibers at a time and this total arrangement is called the motor unit. So a single fiber, many muscle fibers. So this is the muscle unit and there are two types of muscle unit. One is a small mo uh, uh, motor unit and another one is the large motor unit. In case of a small motor unit uh, where there is precise kind of control like the eye muscles movement is very much precise. We already know that the eye muscles are also fine fibers, fine muscle fibers. On the other hand, there will be some gross movement like strong and powerful movements like the leg muscles or the hand muscles or the arm muscles. So these kind of movements is done by the large motor unit because there is profuse uh, number of muscle fibers over there. So over there the nerve supply should be strong. And we already know that these are the coarse muscles. Now neuromuscular junction which is very important. Uh, so first of all we need to know that what is the arrangement of the neuromuscular junction. The name itself is saying that it is a junction between the neuronal complex and the muscle fibers. So a nerve fiber will supplying the muscle and this total arrangement is called the neuromuscular junction. So it is a special synapse between the terminal button of a motor neuron and the sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle fiber. You know that the neuron, in, neuron is having its uh, terminal button and its exon and that exon is 
touching the sarcolemma that is the cell membrane of the skeletal muscle and this arrangement is called the neuromuscular junction also known as myoneuronal junction. So there are mainly three major components in the neuromuscular junction. The first the presynaptic or neuronal component that is coming from the neuron it is consists of the terminal button of the or the motor end bulb. Terminal button is also known as the motor end bulb you know that. So there will be a gap in between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic membrane and this gap or space is called the synaptic cleft the space between the pre neuronal and the post muscle synaptic membranes. So what is post synaptic or the muscular component that is including the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber and it is also known as motor end plate. So it has numerous junctional fold and receptor for the binding of acetylcholine. So the neuronal component is motor end valve there will be a space after that that is called the synaptic cleft and then there will be the muscular component which is known as motor end plate motor end bulb synaptic cleft motor end plate so in this picture we can see this is a terminal button or also known as the motor end bulb which is containing numerous acetylcholine vesicles within it then there is a space and this space is called the synaptic cleft and after that this area is the muscle fiber so it is called the motor end plate of sarcolemma this is the electric uh, microscopic picture of actual neuromuscular junction where we can see this green color area is nothing but the synaptic vesicles which is contained in the acetylcholine this is the nucleus obviously the mitochondria sorry and this is the synaptic cleft and this area is the muscle cell containing the motor end plate so this is the normal function like when an action potential or the electrical impulse travels down the exon of the motor neuron to the end bulb that is called the synaptic terminal this causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the end bulb membrane or the presynaptic membrane resulting release of the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft because when the action potential is coming to the motor uh, uh, end bulb or the uh, synaptic uh, terminal then obviously the acetylcholine vesicles that I have shown you those acetylcholine vesicles will fuse with the presynaptic membrane and it will be released within the synaptic cleft and these acetylcholine then uh, diffuse through the synaptic cleft and bind with the acetylcholine receptor of the motor end plate that means that acetylcholine will bind with the muscle uh, fibers receptor sites because motor end uh, plate is having binding site for the receptors uh, of acetylcholine and those receptors will bind with the acetylcholine and then a new action potential will be generated into the muscle fiber that means the action potential which was generating into the neuronal end that is now generating into the muscle end or the muscle fibers but that action potential is traveling by the acetylcholine receptors immediately after it binds with the receptor the acetylcholine is broken down by the acetylcholinesterase enzyme this enzyme is present in the synaptic cleft because once the neuromuscular junction is working that means when the action potential is coming from the presynaptic membrane to the postsynaptic membrane the function of the acetylcholine is done then this extra acetylcholine should be break, broken down by the acetylcholine starase enzyme so that this action potential is not generating any further so this is the mechanism of the skeletal muscle contraction now what will happen when the muscle fiber is activated by the neuron a long list of functions first of all the action potential or electrical impulse will travel down to the exon to the motor neuron uh, to the end bulb or synaptic terminal that we have already know that the synaptic terminal the motor end uh, bulb that will uh, activate it we can see over here these are the acetylcholine vesicles red color these are the synaptic cleft with uh, acetylcholine starase molecules 
these are the postsynaptic membrane containing the receptor site for the acetylcholine. Now, the acetyl uh, the action potential causes the synaptic vesicles or acetylcholine vesicles to fuse at the end bulb membrane and resulting the release of the acetylcholine to the synaptic cleft. We can see over here it is fusing, vesicles are fusing and releasing the acetylcholine molecules. These are red color things, the acetylcholine molecules. And these acetyl molecule, uh, choline molecules is ri right now is present in the synaptic cleft. Then after that we can see that acetylcholine molecules will binding the receptor site for the postsynaptic membrane. Acetylcholine diffuse across the synaptic cleft and binding the acetylcholine receptors of the motor end plates over here we can see. These are the receptors, purple color thing which is binding with the acetylcholine molecules. Now once an action potential is generating at the motor end plate, it will spread like the electrical current along the sarcolem of the muscle fiber obviously. Then this action potential will also spread into the T tubules. Obviously, we know that the sarcolemma is activated by the action potential. Right now, that sarcolemma is invaginating all, uh, as a T tubule already we have mentioned. So, when the T tubule through the T tubule, the action potential is going, then on each side of the T tubule, there was sarcoplasmic reticulum as triad we have already mentioned. So, that sarcoplasmic reticulum will release the calcium ion. This will cause the calcium ion gated channel to open, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum can uh, allowing the calcium ion to diffuse into the sarcoplasm. So we can see that sarcoplasmic reticulum is releasing the calcium and that calcium is binding with the binding with the troponin molecules because we know that there was C site of the troponin molecules. So that calcium will bind with the C site of the troponin molecules and I site of the troponin touches the tropomyosin. Now, we know that uh, there was T site to binding with the tropomyosin. The troponin is binding with the tropomyosin by the T site, but when the calcium is binding with the C site, this I site or the inhibitory site will be rotating and it will touching the tropomyosin. And when this is happening, the troponin tropomyosin complex is broken down and what will happen after that when it is broken down it causes the downward migration of the tropomyosin molecules to expose the binding site of the actin molecules because we know that the tropomyosin was covering the active site of the actin molecules so when the troponin tropomyosin complex is broken down uh, then this tropomyosin molecules are moving away from the active site of the actin molecules that means it is actually invaginating within the actin molecules. So, using the stored energy, the attached myosin head will pivot towards the center of the sarcomere and bind, binds with the active binding site of the actin filament. So, what will happen when the active site of the actin molecules are exposed, then over here we can see the active site is exposed. The head of the myosin filaments will bind with the active side of the actin filaments and by the movements of the hinge movement that we have already told you it is moving the active side one after another we can see it is bending over here by the use of an ATP which is broken down into ADP and the IP the ATP and the reinforcers are released from the myosin head we can see by the use of an ATP this head of the myosin filaments is traction doing the traction of the active side of the actin filaments over here and ultimately they are moving the actin filaments to the center of the sarcomere. We can see this pivot movement is happening. Don't worry I will show you a video to make it uh, clear. So by this liberating by this liberated energy the traction of the myosin head occurs along the actin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere which I have already told you, the length of the individual muscle fiber decreases because you know on each side this myosin head is trying to pull the actin filaments to the center. So on each side when this is happening the total length of the sarcomere will be decreased and even this sarcomere is decreasing individually when there are a lot of sarcomere it all are decreasing in length by these movements the total muscle contraction will be taking place. So the myosin head attached to the actin molecules binding site, we can see the myosin pulls the actin molecules, we can see this is the 
relaxed condition over here and when this myosin is dragging this actin filaments towards the central line this will happen we can see z line to z line distance is quite long in the relaxation condition and when there is contraction the interdigitation of the actin and the myosin is maximum and the total length is now very short so this is the sliding theory and this sliding theory is done by the head of the myosin filaments and the active side of the actin filaments a new molecules of atp binds with the myosin head causes the cross bridge to detach from the acting strand this means that when a single traction is done a new atp should come to the head of the myosin filament to detach the myosin filaments from the previous active side of the actin filaments that means myosin head is using atp not only to traction the actin filaments but also to get release from the active side of the actin filaments by the use of another atp so the myosin head will get re-energized for the next contraction as the atp will again break down into atp and the ip so only myosin filament will be detached from the active side of the actin filaments when there will be a new atp is coming over there then by the use of that new atp the the myosin head will release from the active side of the actin filament and it will attach to the new active side of the actin filaments as long as the active sites are still exposed the myosin head can bind again and again to the next active site so this is actually happening into the muscle contraction now some of the important notes are if there is no longer action potential generated to the motor neuron no more acetylcholine will be released Acetylcholine sterase will remove the acetylcholine from the motor end plate and action potential transmission of the muscle fiber will end. So if the action potential is stopped into the neural component there will be no acetylcholine so there will be no post synective formation of the action potential. So calcium gets in the sarcoplasmic reticulum will be closed and the calcium will be actively transported back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum so if there is no action potential the unused calcium will get back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum again with calcium removed from the sarcoplasm tropomyosin will recover the active site of the actin so when there is no action potential then tropomyosin will again cover the active site of the actin which are unused right now no more cross bridge and interaction can form and thin myofilaments slide back to its resting stage that means that actin filaments troponin and tropomyosin complex will go back to its normal resting stage now to make it more clear let's see a video You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. 
Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body allowing you to take notes. So students, you can understand you are taking notes and what is actually happening into the muscle fibers of your hand. You use my... Now some of the important points to be noted. Skeletal muscle fibers, shortened as thick filament, interact within thin filament or cross base and sliding occurs that is called the power stroke that we have seen in the video. The trigger for contraction is the calcium ion released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum when the muscle fibers is simulated by its motor neuron. Contraction is an active process, relaxation and getting back to its normal resting length is entirely a passive process. If no new ATP comes to detach myosin head from the active side of the actin, the myofibril remain contra contracted as actin myosin bridge remain contracted, resulting rigor mortis. Actually what is happening in the rigor mortis, which is very important, you know that ATP is used not only myosin head to attach to the active side of the actin but also for releasing of the myosin head from the actin active side. A new ATP should come. So what will happen in the dead body or the person who is suddenly dying there will be no generation of the new ATP. So when the person is dying all the muscles are contracted that means all the head of the myosin filaments is attached with the active side of the actin. So suddenly the person died so no new ATP is coming 
So still the head of the myosin filaments are attached with the active side of the actin and the contraction of the muscle remains even after the death of that person. And the person looks like he is very much in contracted position of all of his limbs and body. And this is called the rigor mortis. That means rigor means contraction and mortis means dead body. It is commonly found in the accidental death like the person is dying due to the drowning or electrical contrition or any sorts of sudden death. There are two points called hypertrophy and muscle tone. Hypertrophy is the stressing of muscle. It means when you are doing exercise it causes more myofilaments or myofibrils to produce within the muscle fibers allows for more cross bridges resulting in more force as well as stronger size. So when you are doing the exercise your muscles are hypertrophied like the bodybuilders. Muscle tone. There are always some motor unit activity within the muscle fiber even in the rest. That means when you are in the sleeping or in the taking rest you are not controlling your whole body at, the, at that time even your muscles are in partial resting condition, partial contracted position and that is called the muscle tone. This creates a resting tension known as the muscle tone which helps stabilizing bone and joints and prevent atrophy. You know that even you are sleeping due to the sudden stimulus you can woke up very fast because your muscles are always ready to contract or to do certain things. But if there is no nerve supply the muscle will never get excited or stimulated to do certain things. For, for example the patients who are having stroke and bed retained they are not using any movements of their body and you understand that the person who are staying in the bed for a, a due to the stroke and some paralysis of their limbs those limbs are getting thinner day by day because all the muscles present in that limbs are getting atrophy or disuse atrophy. That means muscle tone is very important or movements of the muscles are very important to prevent atrophy. Now very important topic nowadays very commonly asked is sprout muscle. Sprout muscles are which type of muscles? These muscles is having a swing component which is one that tends to produce an angular movement of a joint. When this swing component is more powerful the muscle is called the sprout muscle. That means these sprout muscles are having a swing component that means it is swinging something. What you, it will swing? It will swing a joint and it will produce angular movement. And in a sprout muscle the fixed attachment is usually further away from the joint and it provides acceleration the motion of the joint like brachialis muscle. We will show a picture so you can understand no worries. And then shunt muscle. What is shunt muscle? A shunt component is one which tends to draw the bones along the shaft towards the joint and compress the articular surface when the shunt component is more powerful the muscle is called the shunt muscle. In shunt muscle the fixed attachment is close to the joint. Shunt muscle provides stability of the joint rather than the movements. For example brachioradialis. Let's see a diagram. Over here we can see the joint is elbow joint two muscles you can use the brachialis that I have mentioned already and the biceps where the attachment or origin of the biceps and brachialis is quite above you know that and these muscles are mainly doing the movement of the elbow joint that movement is the flexion we can see their attachment is very away from the joint itself you can see over here their origin is very distal from the joint. They are doing powerful action on the 
mobile bone that is the distal bone this is the fixed bone that is the humerus and this is the distal bone that is the ulna over here to do the angular movement and this is called the sprout muscles but on the other hand which is the shunt muscle their attachment is very much close to the joint you can see the brachioradialis muscle attachment is very much close to the joint but their distal attachment is quite far away from the joint they are mainly stabilizing this joint rather than its movement this is called the shunt muscles like the brachioradialis even you know that as you have finished your super extremity card the chief flexor of the elbow joint is the brachialis and the biceps brachii but not the brachioradialis so you can understand the sprout muscle is doing the movement mainly but the stern muscle is mainly supporting the joint thank you very much today we have finished all the muscle slides you can see a picture of a guy next to the thank you do you know what is the name of this person you can understand he is a bodybuilder but he is very much renowned for some particular characteristics the question remains to you thank you so my dear student that was all for today's presentation we have finished the muscle tissue so you might have some of the questions because it was quite a long topic so if you have any questions kindly let me know that and uh, in this uh, coronavirus situation try to stay at home maintain the personal hygiene and also uh, try to be safe and keep other people safe take care